Hello beautiful people, my name is Vendi and today I'm going to be telling you all of the books that I read throughout the month of May. I am no longer actually in Boston, I'm currently in South Carolina visiting my family before we all go to Croatia for the summer. Or at least that's what I'm going to be doing by the time you're watching this video. At the time that I'm filming, I'm still in Boston. Today is my final day here before I pack up and ship off to go see my family and I'm very excited for that. But I thought it best since I spent the first three-ish weeks of May in Boston and I'm going to keep the books that I read here, I thought it best to pre-film this part of the video and then I'll have the last little bit, the books that I read in South Carolina filmed over there and I'll tack it on to the end of this. So before I get into the books that I read, and there's not very many of them so this is going to be a fairly short video, I want to get some channel cleanup housekeeping things ready. The first thing that I want you guys to know is that I'm not going to be keeping very strictly to my two videos a week, Wednesday and Saturday schedule for the month of June, July, and probably August. My internet connection is much slower in Croatia and I will be doing a lot of summer things and work things, so I might not be filming as much, so it's going to be harder to edit and then later upload all the videos that I would like to for you guys. Instead, for those months, I'm planning on doing about one video a week, probably on Saturday because that's just most convenient for me, and perhaps some auxiliary videos here and there. This is going to be especially relevant in June because throughout the month of June and for the second half of May, I am taking a summer course called Novel Into Film, and for that course I'm going to be reading some very interesting books and watching some very very interesting movies, so I'll probably be talking about them on this channel. But what that means is, because I'm taking an entire course in six weeks, everything is going to be really condensed and I'm going to have a lot more to do for that than I would like to. So that's going to cut into my filming and booktubing time. So just bear with me throughout these summer months. I promise I will get right back on track when I come back in the fall. While I'm in Croatia, I will definitely be doing reading vlogs all over so that you guys can see some of my favorite place in the entire world. And I hope that you guys enjoy seeing that little part of my life as well on this channel. All right, I think that's all the housekeeping things. But since we're here right now, let me just uh, tell you about the things that I've read during these couple weeks of May while I was in Boston. The first book that I read in May was The Way of Shadows by Brent Weeks. This is the first book in Brent Weeks' Lightbringer trilogy and it's actually I think his debut novel. In it we follow Kylar, a street urchin turned wet boy, which is essentially a type of assassin but it's the worst possible name for a type of assassin, as he basically rises in rank and power in this world full of political intrigue and drama. The Way of Shadows is exactly what I predicted it would be. It's a very pulpy, noir-type fantasy, the sort with a 90% male cast, blatant misogyny, homophobia galore. It's, it's a bit of a mess. And I still somehow enjoyed it. Brent Weeks is very good at writing a plot that you want to keep reading. His strength is definitely plot and not character. While the players felt a little underwhelming and a little lacking, many of them were not fleshed out, particularly the women, the storyline itself was very intriguing and I sort of want to know what happens next. I don't think I'm going to be continuing this series anytime soon, but it's not something that I would never ever read and I gave it a 2.5 out of 5 stars. That is a number that you're going to become very, very familiar with by the end of this video. The next book that I read in the month of May was When Dimple Met Rishi by Sandhya Menon. In this book we follow both Dimple and Rishi, an Indian American girl and boy who are sort of thrust together by their parents to an IT summer camp. Dimple is there because she really loves IT and she thought that this summer camp was basically her parents' way of showing that they encourage her dream of becoming a web developer and coder. I don't know much about that stuff, so I'm not going to be able to speak on it intelligently. And Rishi is there because his parents and Dimple's parents have sort of potentially arranged a marriage between the two of them, and he's a hopeless romantic, and he wants to meet the girl that he thinks he's going to be spending the rest of his life with. Dimple is not about that. She's not into the whole tradition thing at all. She just sort of wants to do her own thing. So their first meeting does not go all that well, but the story goes from there and they find love and respect for one another anyway, despite their very different ideals at the start. I say this is the second book I read. I really read it alongside of the one of the next three books that I'm going to mention, and I think that that's where it went wrong for me. When Dimple Met Rishi is essentially a rom-com in book form. Without spoiling any actual plot, I can tell you literally the whole story. It's your classic boy meets girl 
boy likes girl, she doesn't like him very much. They kind of get together. A big crushing thing happens that drives them apart. Boy wins girl over anyway, yet more miniature conflicts happen in the end, they get together. If that sounds like every other rom-com you've ever seen or heard or read, it's because it is, and it's pretty sweet. What isn't sweet is that throughout the book, Dimple maintained a sort of not like other girls attitude towards other women. The side characters were not very developed, and Rishi stayed kind of creepily obsessive over her. It was, I don't know, I, I, I was kind of squicked out by it. I think I would have enjoyed this book a lot more if I was more in the mood to watch a rom-com when I picked it up, and I think I would have enjoyed it a lot more if I read it all in one go, because like a rom-com, which is a movie that you're supposed to just watch in like one quick moment, I feel like this book is much better enjoyed if you read through it quickly and you don't have time to think about some of the more problematic aspects. Either way, it was really sweet and I loved like the little bits of just Indian culture that you get in here. I loved seeing how different Dimple and Rishi's experiences as Indian American people were. And cheesy as it was, I did love the happy ending. So I ended up giving When Dimple Met Rishi a 2.5 out of 5 stars. But I think that if I read it all in one go, it might have been a higher rating. Who knows? When I revisit it, and I think I definitely will, we'll see how my opinion on it changes. The next three books that I read were all a part of Mass May, which I'm doing with my friend Lou over at Bookstore Way of Life, or I suppose I did with my friend Lou over at Bookstore Way of Life, because by the time you're watching this, May is over. Anyway, I'll have Lou linked in the description box below in case you haven't seen her by now, because you should definitely check out her channel. She's absolutely delightful. And if her Mass May video is up by now, I'll link that as well, because I'm sure it'll be wonderful. But basically, uh, throughout the month of May, Lou, I, and several other of our booktube friends who I'll also link in the description box below, read Sarah J. Mass's A Court of Thorns and Roses series, reading one book a week for the entire month of May. So we started with A Court of Thorns and Roses, we continued with A Court of Mist and Fury, and we finished with A Court of Wings and Roses. So I'm not going to talk too much about the Akatar trilogy because I'm doing some Mass May vlogging. Part 1 may already be up by the time you see this video, and part 2 will have a spoilery series review. Basically, I'm not going to talk at length about these books because I will have already talked at length about them elsewhere. Overall, this series disappointed me. The first book is a Beauty and the beast retelling with the fae, so fairies, high elves a la Legolas from Lord of the Rings if you need a visual description. I found the plot slow, the characters underdeveloped, and the world building rushed. And I ended up giving A Court of Thorns and Roses 2.5 stars. The 2.5 stars all come from the last quarter-ish of the book where an actual plot began to develop. It's called Under the Mountain, and if you've read the books, you know what I mean. That section of the book saved it for me and made me very, very excited to dive into A Court of Mist and Fury, which is book two. Akamath is so much better than A Court of Thorns and Roses. I almost couldn't believe that the same author had written both of them. The world building was much stronger, the characters were far more dynamic and fleshed out, and there was a greater cast of them, and we actually got other women besides the protagonist in book two. I was delighted. And the plot was just phenomenal. It was well paced, it was very exciting and interesting, and it was high stakes. I mentioned in my reading vlog that the first book feels like a romantic pseudo-fantasy, which is some fantasy elements thrown in, but it's essentially a romance book. It's all about the kissy stuff, everything else is sort of auxiliary. A Court of Mist and Fury did not feel that way at all. It felt very much like a high fantasy that also had romantic elements dipped in. When I say romantic, I occasionally mean erotic because Sarah J Maas' sex scene basically pushed this book, this whole entire series really, so far out of YA and into new adult that I'm not sure how anyone could in good conscience market it. My only complaint with A Court of Mist and Fury is actually the foundation it's built on, so Akatar. I ended up giving A Court of Mist and Fury a 4.75 out of 5 stars because I just could not distance it from Akatar enough and look at it alone, which I don't think you should look at books in a series alone because they're all part of one cohesive storyline. Regardless, I really, really enjoyed A Court of Mist and Fury, and it made me very excited to pick up book three, A Court of Wings and Ruin. A Court of Wings and Ruin. That is why I'm disappointed in the series. I thought that overall I'd give the series like four stars as like a collective rating. I thought that I would just adore it. I didn't think that I would like Akawar as much as Akamath because every review ever says it's not as good. What every review ever doesn't say is that all the steps forward that Akamath took 
Akawar takes about half of them back. The plot is still very interesting, but it slows down considerably in Akawar. There's a middle of the book slump, and that just shouldn't happen in the concluding book in a series. Tension should continue to be rising, and about halfway through, the shit should hit the fan. You know? You know that a great war is building throughout the entire series, so something like it should happen. It was unnecessarily slow. The world building, it went from being great to just being good. In Akatar, one thing that I really disliked was info dumps, like literally pages long info dumps, where things that could have been woven in throughout the entire story were just told to you, or told to the main character by a secondary character, and it just really didn't work for me. It felt very lazy. The same thing happened in Akawar. By this point, by book three, you ought to know your world well enough that you shouldn't have to do that. What really bothered me, and you'll hear a lot of people talking about the forced diversity of this book, yeah, it's, it's remarkably heteronormative. It's remarkably kind of transphobic. Um, the way that, the thing that we call men and women in this is males and females, which when you add that, you know, biological determinism aspect to it, it sort of kills the idea that trans people can even exist in the fey world that Sarah J Maas has written. Just because, I mean, you're told every time you're talking about a man, this is a man with a penis, this is a woman with a vagina, and it's just, okay, you know? And Sarah J Maas apparently got some flack for that, which, you know, is pretty well deserved. But I think a lot of the backtracking that she did with this, especially character-wise for the established characters, was in that she was trying to play a game of diversity bingo or diversity darts where she was just like, you get a sexuality that hasn't been alluded to up till now and it's gonna be a great big reveal and the reason is you were hiding it for 500 years, like really. I don't wanna say any spoilers, um, so I'm just gonna say the name of the character more. I'm gutted. It's not good. It, it failed miserably. I think that Bloomsbury ought to have hired many, many, many sensitivity readers for what Sarah J Maas tried to do, because it just didn't work. Additionally, there was a bit of abuse apologism that I just, I can't abide by. Characters in books one and two who were consistently awful and did very, very horrible things did not get punished in the same ways in book three. So all of the female abusers, all of the women who acted in abusive ways met very grisly ends, and it was very deserved, and it was very cathartic to see it happen. The abusive men, on the other hand, were rewarded with kingdoms. This is a topic that hits home for me, so if I'm a little angrier than usual, that's why I'm, I'm gonna stop talking about it. Basically, there was no parity in how abusive women were treated compared to abusive men, and I get it. They're pretty boys. They're all pretty. They're fey, but that doesn't make them not abusive assholes. That doesn't make them deserving of redemption just because they're pretty. Oh boy. So on a technical level, Akawar would have been maybe a three star read. From an emotional level, I want to give it about one star because Sarah J Mass spat in the face of bisexual women and in the face of abuse survivors. I ended up giving it like a 2.25 out of five stars. Also, there wasn't really a fully conclusive ending, which you expect from the last book in a trilogy, which I think, I've mentioned it before, is really disingenuous. Like if you're writing a trilogy and then you decide to make a spin-off, make it so that the trilogy concludes by itself so people can choose whether or not to read the spin-off, and then trust that your readers are loyal enough to pick up your next work anyway, you know? While reading those three, at various points in time, I listened to the audiobook of Peter Pan by J.M. Barrie. It is the version that's narrated by Jim Dale, and I I absolutely fell in love. I am not an audiobooks person. I get distracted very, very easily. So what I did for this one is that I listened to it at double speed while I was at the gym. Peter Pan is my favorite story of all time, and I think that I would enjoy it no matter what medium it was told in. I fell in love with the story all over again. I had never had it read to me as a child the way I had Lord of the Rings read to me when I was little, but it felt kind of like that. I felt like a kid getting the story read to me, and it made me very, very happy to hear a cornerstone of my childhood narrated to me while I was, you know, dying at the gym. It made going to the gym far more bearable, and I highly recommend the Jim Dale narrated version if you're planning on listening to Peter Pan. I gave it a five out of five stars because I don't think I could ever give Peter Pan anything less. And the last book, if you can even call it, I guess you can, it's published as a book. The last book that I read in the month of May so far was The Lorax by Dr. Seuss. I was feeling very afraid for the environment, and I saw it 
at the library and I just wanted to flip through something very, very quickly. So I read the Lorax, the environmental message, the art style that's so distinctive about Dr. Seuss, the rhyme scheme, the ridiculous rhyme scheme, all of it warms my heart in ways that I'm not sure almost anything else could. Dr. Seuss is a beloved author and there's a reason for it. And I was just really excited to get to pick up and read a book that just shaped the way that I think about the environment as a child and has continued to shape the way I think about it as an adult today. As of right now, I'm about halfway through The Book of Dust by Philip Pullman, and I'm very much enjoying it, but uh, I'll have future Vandy tell you more about that, because she's probably going to have finished it by the time we get to Charleston, so let's do a quick little time jump. I made a goof. I didn't actually end up reading anything more in May except for one very short novel for one of my classes this summer. It's called The Mustache by Emmanuel Carrere. I probably completely butchered how that's supposed to be said. I have a picture of it here at some point so you can see what it's supposed to look like and hopefully those of you who speak French will know what I was trying to say. Basically, it is a book about a man who shaves his mustache except nobody in his life believes that he ever had a mustache, so throughout the entire novel you have to wonder, is he going crazy? Is everyone else crazy? Is there an elaborate prank being pulled on this man? Are there multiple realities being sort of torn open and then reattached? It's it's a bit of a mindfuck. It's really good. I think I gave it a 4 out of 5 stars, but I like the film a little better, so I suggest you watch that instead, maybe. Or do both. I think both of them are definitely worth taking a look at. With that said, I have to sign off. I don't have very much time to film, as evidenced by this really messy thing, and I want to get this video edited and uploaded as soon as possible. I'll be back soon with my TBR for June, and thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you like me, you know what to do. Maybe consider subscribing, and apparently ring the bell, because YouTube's algorithm is really messing with how people's subscriptions are being put into their subscription boxes. It's a mess, and I'm a mess, but hopefully you guys are kind of into that, so if you are, please maybe hit that bell. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you next time, guys. Goodbye.